Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. It's great to see you all this beautiful summer day. Let's prepare for worship this morning as we quiet our hearts and minds and listen to this morning's prelude. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deanna Self Price, one of the pastors here at Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. And if you're with us for the first time this morning, we want to say a special welcome to you. It's good to have you here with us in worship. Our, my colleague in ministry, Pastor Gaylene, is away this week. She is on vacation, but she will be returning sometime next week. But this morning, I'm going to be leading us in worship solo. So uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to see you with us. Um, I want to just say a word to those of you who are with us this morning for the first time. It is our practice at Shepherd of the Hills to fill out a prayer and presence card. You received that as you came in this morning. Fill that out. We ask everybody to do so. Drop it into the offering plate at the time of offering. It is a great way for everyone to stay in touch with the pastors and with the church office if there's information that you have for us that you'd like us to be aware of. It's also a way for us to stay in touch with you. So please do fill that out. Also, a little bit later in our worship service, if you would like to be introduced to our congregation, if you're here for the first time, in front of you, you will find a pink welcome card. All you have to do is fill that out. Just print your name and any other information on that. Drop that into the offering plate at the time of offering, and we'll do the rest. We'll introduce you to our church family. We want to invite everybody to come over and join us in Fellowship Hall for a coffee hour. We always have coffee and great conversation, and sometimes we have goodies. So uh, come over and join us. It's a great time following our worship service. But right now, let's stand and let's join our voices in some of our favorite hymns and songs.
Please be seated, and let's join our hearts in prayer. God of old stories and new beginnings, open our lives today to the new possibilities that you long to accomplish for us. As you called our forefathers and foremothers in the faith to walk with you, speak our names today and call us to higher purposes. Fill us with your spirit that we may praise you and lift your holy name on high. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lift your name on high, Lord, I love to sing your praises. You're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came to heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. I have sworn and I fully mean it. I will keep your righteous rules. I have been suffering so much. Lord, make me live again according to your promise. Please, Lord, accept my spontaneous gifts of praise. Teach me your rules. Though my life is constantly in danger, I won't forget your instruction. Though the wicked have set a trap for me, I won't stray from your precepts. Your laws are my possession forever because they are my heart's joy. I have decided to keep your statutes forever, every last one. My word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. My word is a lamp unto my feet and a light.
Over the summer, we've been taking a special look at the book of Genesis, and we've been asking the question, why is it so hard to understand the Old Testament? We've been thinking together about our very beginnings that shaped our faith, and we've been hoping to grow not only in our own understanding of Judaism, but also in our understanding of Christianity. We've been listening to some very difficult stories, stories that have helped us understand that when God decided to create a people and be in relationship with that people, there were bound to be moments when we and God would try each other's patience. And yet, as we have heard over the last several weeks, God never gives up on us. God always seeks to bring about goodness in this life, even when we ourselves have behaved in the worst of ways. So today we hear the story of the scoundrel and cheat by the name of Jacob, a man whose life is turned upside down by God so that he can become a key figure in God's purposes for God's people. So from chapters 25 and 28 of the book of Genesis, here is the story of Jacob and Esau, or as I like to call it, modern family. And it came to pass thus that Isaac took Rebekah to wife and to conceive and treated the Lord. But the children struggled within her, and of this to God she implored. God said, two nations are in thy womb, and to manner of people hunger. One shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, and the sister of Laban the Aramean, from Padam Aram. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, since she was unable to have children. The Lord was moved by his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. But the boys pushed against each other inside of her, and she said, If this is what it's like, why did it happen to me? So she went to the Lord to ask the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two different peoples will emerge from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. The firstborn was a hairy child, and thus they called his name Esau. The second took hold of Esau's heel, and he was called Jacob evermore. And as they grew, Isaac loved Esau, but his wife's love for Jacob was real. T'was Esau who fell faint from hunger, and asked Jacob to share his meal. When she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered that she had twins. The first came out red all over, clothed with hair, and she named him Esau. And immediately afterward, his brother came out gripping Esau's heel, and she named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. But when the young men grew up, Esau became an outdoorsman who knew how to hunt, and Jacob became a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was boiling stew, Esau came in from the field hungry and said to Jacob, I'm starving. Let me devour some of this red stuff. And that's why his name is Edom. 
And Jacob said, sell me thy birthright. Esau replied, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do me? And sold it to Jacob where he lie. And Isaac unto Esau said, Son, I know not the hour of my death. Take thy weapons, thy quiver, thy bow, that we eat before my dying breath. Jacob said to Esau, Sell me your birthright today. Esau said, since I'm going to die anyway, what good is my birthright to me? Jacob said, give me your word today. And he did. He sold his birthright to Jacob. So Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and he drank and he got up and he left, showing just how little he thought of his birthright. There Isaac said, let people serve thee, and unto thee let nations bow down. Cursed be everyone that cursed thee, and blessed be thy name renowned. And God Almighty said unto Jacob, the land I gave Abram and Isaac, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And there shall be no taking back. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He reached a certain place and he spent a night there. And when the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and he put it near his head. And then he lay down there. He dreamed and he saw a raised staircase, its foundation on the earth and its top touching the sky. And God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Surely the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south, and every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought to himself, the Lord is definitely in this place. But I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, this sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. And after Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head and he set it up as a sacred pillar. And then he poured oil on top of it. And he named that sacred place Bethel. Though Luz was the city's original name. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is the word of the Lord. This morning, our Bible story tells us about Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and his brother Esau. They were twins, fraternal twins, and they had about as much in common as a socket wrench and a frying pan. Their parents, Isaac and Rebecca, were caught quite by surprise when the twins were born. Rebecca had been unable to have children. And Isaac finally took the matter to God, and the next thing that the couple knew, it's twins. Which is to say, be careful what you pray for. <laughs> Isaac's mother, Sarah, was a much older woman when she conceived Isaac. And Rebecca was barren when she brought twins into the world. Anything, my friends, is possible with God. Which is what I think the writers of the Old Testament want us to understand about these stories. These stories all have a purpose. And the purpose is to remind us that anything, anything is possible with this God of the Hebrew Testament. So bear that in mind. Esau was the firstborn by only a few seconds, but those few seconds mean everything in the world to which he was born. This was the time of the law of primogeniture, which meant that Esau, Esau was the favored son when it came to his father's legacies. Esau got it all. There were no wills, there were no trust funds, and there were no codicils in that day. Just the law of primogeniture, which meant that Esau got the lion's share of the inheritance. It was his birthright. Now, it's important to know about birthrights when we read these stories. It's the only way that we can make any sense of them. A birthright was everything in those days. It meant the difference between a life of power and privilege and a life of deference. Everyone in the family deferred to the one who held the birthright. Birth order determined everything about a man and a woman in those days. A way to understand this for our time is found in the book Another Country. It was written by Mary Pfeiffer, a nurse turned social worker who wanted to understand the older generations of our country. The book's title comes from the notion that for older Americans, the country they are living in isn't the country where they grew up. Things have changed so much and so fast that this seems like a very different place to many of us. I recently upgraded my iPhone, and I am fairly savvy at being able to use it now. But there was a time when I had to have some coaching about all of the ways that I could use my iPhone to make my life easier. And to whom did I go for help? My 17-year-old daughter. We didn't have computers in my school growing up. And if we did, we had one computer in the science lab, and only the science geeks ever got a chance to use it. My daughter, however, has grown up with computers and iPhones and iPads, and she has been keyboarding since she was in the third grade. You should see that young woman text. Talk about flying digits. 
She puts me to shame with my one finger hunt and peck with that small keyboard on my phone. Mary Pfeiffer writes about our expectation that everything, that our lives would always stay the same. But here we are in a digital age, and very few things, institutions, customs, etc., are as they were. And so our sense of stability has been lost in all that has transpired in the last 30 to 50 years. For better or for worse, nothing is the same when we were all younger. So another way of saying this is that we have lost what we thought was our birthright. And the grief and the loss is real. Being born in this country at the first half of the last century meant certain things. There were certain expectations that went with our, our citizenship, especially for those who are Caucasian. A high school education was a certitude if that was what one wanted, if college was not an option, whether the lack of aptitude or lack of money, then there were vocations available that paid a living wage that empowered one to raise one's family with some comfort. Factory jobs were plentiful, and vocational schools were inexpen inexpensive for those wanting to enter the trades. And because of Social Security, we had the expectation that we would be provided for as we aged. To be sure, there were other components to this birthright. But suffice it to say, we could reasonably expect to have the wherewithal to pursue life, to pursue liberty, and our happiness. But life changed. Do you see how this birthright business can affect us? It affected Esau. Firstborn sons had it made. But right from the start, even in their mother's womb, the twins began to struggle. And while Esau was born first, right behind him was Jacob holding on to his brother's heel for dear life. And it was as if right from the start that Jacob sought to get the advantage, to get ahead of Esau. I read somewhere that that's how Jacob got his name. It meant heal, which ends up being a pretty good description of that second-born son. The Bible makes it very clear this morning that Jacob was a less-than-stand-up guy. He was a trickster. He was a schemer, a cheater from the very beginning. The twins were as different as night and day. And the struggle that began in the womb continued into their adult life. Esau was the skilled hunter. He was an outdoorsman who lived day by day off the land and by his brawn. Jacob was more settled. He was less prone to wander. And he lived by his wits. He was as smart as they come and he would have made a great corporate raider. Which is evident the day that Esau came home famished from the fields and his younger brother plied him with stew. Now can you see what is coming in this story? Jacob drove a hard bargain for that bowl of stew for Esau's birthright. And Esau never had a clue concerning what was happening in that moment. It never occurred to him that he was losing everything 
everything in that meal. Jacob dangled that stew right in front of Esau and then held on until he got what he wanted from his brother. And in that moment, everything changed. The birthright passed to Jacob, the schemer and the dreamer, the cheater and the trickster. Not long after that, it was time for the twin's father, Isaac, to bestow the all-important blessing on the older son. Now, the blessing was different from the birthright. The birthright said that the oldest son got it all when his father passed on. But the blessing, the blessing was the affirmation by the father that this was the intended son to whom the family would turn once Isaac passed away. With his mother's help, Jacob, the younger twin, dressed himself up in animal skins and seemed larger and hairier like his older brother Esau. And then he stole into his father's tent and he passed himself off as Esau. Now Isaac was very wise with age by this time, as the Bible is fond of saying, which meant, of course, that he was up there in years and his eyesight was quite poor. And so in the dim light of the tent, he saw a very large figure and that felt very hairy. And so he gave the young man kneeling beside him his blessing. And that was that. It was a one-time only thing. It couldn't ever be rescinded, and it couldn't ever be repeated. Jacob had successfully usurped Esau out of everything that he had coming to him. There was absolutely nothing left. I don't believe that we have anything like this blessing in our culture. However, if you have ever sought the approval of a parent, this might come close. The idea of not meeting a parent's expectations, of not measuring up by the standards set by them, of somehow feeling just not good enough, that's a painful way to lead a life. And when Esau realized what happened, when he realized that he would never receive Isaac's blessing because Jacob had taken even that from him. He was ready to kill Jacob. I'm sure that there are those of us with brothers and sisters here this morning who have had those murderous thoughts toward our siblings, especially when we were younger. Oh, come on, be honest. Yeah, okay. But we have probably never, ever thought seriously about carrying out those murderous thoughts. Esau, on the other hand, was deadly serious. And he would have cut Jacob's life short had Rebekah not intervened and sent Jacob away to live with her brother, Laban. It was on the way to Laban's country that Jacob had that dream that dream about a stone ramp and angels. We sing about it all the time, and we just sang about it a few moments ago, Jacob's Ladder, we call it. A few moments ago, I stated that the stories in the Bible have a purpose. To remind us that anything can happen when we travel in the company of our God. Throughout the Bible, we are constantly reminded that with God, anything is possible. Barren women give birth. Twins who struggle in the womb continue to struggle into adulthood. And schemers and dreamers, my friends, often come out ahead. Anything, anything is possible with the God of Israel. 
And what is astounding is that we never know whom God will use or choose to lead God's people. The Hebrew Testament is filled with stories of surprised and surprising people that God invites and selects and sometimes even browbeats into doing God's will and work. Hagar, Moses, Deborah, Bathsheba, David, Mary of Nazareth, Joseph of Bethlehem, Mary Magdalene, Peter and Paul, and Jacob. God used Jacob to build a people, a nation for God's purposes, just as God used Jacob's grandfather and grandmother, Abraham and Sarah. And we remember their story. But all of this makes no sense to us because, after all, here with Jacob is a man who preyed on his older brother's weaknesses and took his birthright. And then he fooled his father into giving him a blessing that should rightfully have gone to Esau. Folks, <laughs> the Old Testament really is modern family. Or perhaps more appropriately, Game of Thrones. A little bit later in Jacob's story, on the banks of the river Jabbok, God wrestles this cheating conniver to the ground and maims him in the hip. And then God does something really crazy. God gives Jacob a new name. God changes Jacob's name to Israel as if to declare that all of the struggle and all of the conniving and all of the scheming and all of the dreaming was part of God's plan for God's people. Which is why the people of Israel love to tell this story. Not because Jacob was so clever, but because they believed that God could do anything for them. And they could tell the story of Jacob, the man who held his brother's heel, and they could look in the mirror and know that even though they themselves had little reason to be commended to God, God would still love them. God would still do great things through them. God would still use them for God's purposes. And God would stick with them no matter what. God would hold on to God's people like Jacob held on to Esau, even when humanity was behaving like a modern dysfunctional family in the worst of ways. Just like God catches hold of you and, and me, even though we are who we are, flawed, sometimes conniving schemers and, and dreamers. God just catches hold of us in our worst moments even though we may not deserve it. And God still loves us and still works through us and even works in spite of us for our own good and for the good of the creation. Next week, Esau catches up with his brother Jacob, and you're not going to believe what happens. I hope you'll join me next Sunday for the continuing story of Jacob and Esau, or as I call it, at the river. Amen.